Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with renowned Japanese martial arts expert and knife designer, James Williams. James has a deep background, rich with martial arts study, and has trained some of the country's fiercest warriors in blade and other kinds of combatives. But in our circles, he is probably best known for the Hisatsu or the Otenashi no Ken or one of his recent small batch production tantos. I recognized James in my hotel restaurant at Blade Show and introduced myself. But before I did, I couldn't help but contemplate all the elegant ways he could dispatch me if I rushed up on him. So I took my time and I was very polite. Now, I look forward to skimming the surface with James about his life and knives. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell and download the show uh, to your favorite podcast app so you can listen while you're on the go. And as always, please join us on Patreon if you're interested in helping the show uh, uh, keep going. You get extra content, like uh, interview extras from what we're doing tonight here. And uh, you also get entered into knife giveaways. You'll get to see lots of extra exclusive stuff. So to do that, go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Check out the three tiers of support we have there. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit thenifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Mr. James Williams, welcome to the show. It's good to have you here, sir. Nice to see you again. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Uh, so I, I gave people just a very, very uh, rough, rough 30,000 foot view of of your life in martial arts and uh, and especially with blades. Uh, give us a quick and dirty of, about your martial arts training. I was looking at your biography on your website and I I knew I knew a lot about your Japanese study. I had no idea that it went so far and wide. Yeah, well, um, I got really motivated in the 50s going to Catholic school with the Irish. And uh, even though it doesn't look like it, I was a small kid for my age, um, all the way up till a junior in high school. My sister was two years younger, was taller than me, tell us a junior in high school, and had really thick glasses and couldn't see someone's eyes from five or six feet away if my glasses got knocked off. So between having to fight on a regular basis and all those things, I got very motivated to be better at it. So as I got opportunities to do things, wrestling first, uh, in the end, when I got a motorcycle in the early sixties and I could actually go somewhere, um, started, uh, studying karate and I just, continued to study wherever I was. Um, so I've studied arts from most places that teach and been in those places. Um, did some wrestling in high school and college, coached wrestling, which was a lot of fun. I really realized how much I liked teaching. Um, boxed, kickbox. I was taught to box by former middleweight champion, Bobo Olson and Frank Scalarcio Jr., the best martial artist nobody's ever heard of. So Korean arts, Japanese arts, Okinawan arts, Chinese arts, Filipino arts, Russian arts, Western arts. Um, yeah, so so I uh, I studied and uh, you know then started teaching at various times, but I built a dojo to teach primarily Japanese classical arts. Um, what? Let's see how long ago was that? 91, I think I was teaching in my garage in my backyard before then. So, so yeah, it's been a lifelong passion, uh, to, to, to study and do that. Um, and then teaching has been, uh, a great evolution of that in the process. Um, what I teach now in, uh, in the, in the, 
Japanese martial arts, uh, Koryu arts, um, are what the samurai actually used at their highest level. And so it's very different than what we would consider martial arts, not, not, in, not just in the techniques, um, but in how you access your body, how you access your mind, um, no leverage, no force in the sense of muscle flexion. Um, very, very different than other things that uh, I'd spent a long time doing. So it's been a very interesting journey. Um, well, I have a question for you. This comes up a lot in martial arts circles. And, um, you know, uh, you're not just a historian. You're someone who 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 has mastered these more ancient forms of martial arts and then you've translated them and taught them in the modern environment for soldiers and law enforcement and other people that you taught um do you ever have people say to you because i've heard this about kali oh but that's an ancient martial art that has nothing to do with today with fighting on the streets today and part of me thinks uh, i guess i see what you're you mean and fighting on the streets today and what and what town and what country are we fighting in the streets on <laughs> okay thank you so please yeah, what I mean, do you say to that person well so my 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 spiel on martial arts is mars was a god of war war is about killing people and breaking things it's done with tools arts ability to do it to your opponent without having it done back to you now, when we take a look at everything from wrestling or Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which is the Neiwaza Katamiwaza of modern Judo, the ground grappling parts, um, we look at boxing or kickboxing, you know, we look at MMA. Uh, what you're looking at are, are sport based fighting methodologies, right, that uh, involve engagement and reciprocity, okay? Now, the problem when you have lethality is engagement and reciprocity means there's a lot of casualties on both sides, right? You can't exchange blows in environments like that and tough it out, so to speak. So, you know, if you're exchanging bullets with people and you're getting shot, that's a bad idea, right? Um, the most successful people we've had over the last 20 years do a whole lot more giving than anything else. And you don't hear about them, which you shouldn't be hearing about them. So, so there's concepts in Kodiu that are very different than that methodology. And, and before I go on, not knocking any of those things, I've done virtually all of them, mm -hmm. right? MMA wasn't in when I was young enough to do it, but in our kickboxing, we could do takedowns and stuff because Frank was like, hey, people can take you down and slam you on the ground in the street. You need to be able to handle that. Um, so, and all those skill bases I have as well because I did basically all of that stuff. Um, I used to roll around the garage with the Gracies in the, in the, in the 80s when nobody knew who they were, right? Hoist was, could barely speak English. Um, by the way, my name in Portuguese is James. And, yes. <laughs> and, and, and good people, great art, nice people. I, I got a chance to work with their dad. I actually got a chance to roll with him a little bit when he was in his uh, early 80s. Um, and when you get higher level, you can do kind of stuff like that without injuring anybody because he was really good and, uh, and, and, and very knowledgeable, but he's a lot smaller person, so you're not out there pushing, slamming, shoving, banging, or you learn anything anyway. Helio, um, you got to wrestle Helio Gracie. Helio. 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 Wow. wow. Yes. That's how you pronounce it, Helio. Um, yeah, I was very honored. To, I was very honored to spend a little bit of time and, and, and stuff. Uh, so, so what you had with the samurai is fundamentally everything is kenjutsu. All the movements are based on the sword, even though the sword's not a primary battlefield weapon. Um, with the sword, you have lethality, right? You could, you could literally drop the sword and it cut a forearm off. So exchanges of force like you see in the movies and stuff is not something that is done or encouraged in high-level kodiu. You have a concept, o tonachi no kachi, means silent victory. There's no touching the blades in the process. And this, you know, we always have the saying in, you know, when, 
when my enemies are in range, so am I. But the reality is you could be someplace, a couple of rooms back in a house that hasn't had windows a long time in a non-permissive environment, and you could tune some guy up 50 or 75 meters out the front window and technically you're within range of his weapon, but you're not practically. You know, he may not know you're there, but here it's really difficult. We're like six, seven feet apart, right? Or closer and right. And so exchanges of blows and stuff like that aren't acceptable. Um, and so how do you do something like that? That is a whole different level of study. And the fact that, and you see this a little bit in some of the Chumbada movies, the cut them and slash them, which are probably about as realistic as all the gunfighting movies in the West, right? Where people wait for somebody to count or something. Um, not realistic, but multiples on multiples or multiples on one were not uncommon. So now you have time to solution in maybe a second or two or maybe less time than that. Okay, well, so how do you solve this problem and survive? Because Ayuchi mutual killing was common. So I spent a, a good period of my life climbing the top of a, of a very tough food chain, um, you know, with, with my physicality, my, my grit, my fear of failure. <laughs> I always tell people, yeah, I was very successful to kickbox in the 70s. They found people I could beat on the one hand, but I was also, I had, I had a fear of failure. So, so hurting me didn't deter me at all. It was like throwing gasoline on a fire to put it out. It just drove me because I think that maybe I'm getting closer to, to losing. So that doesn't take you a whole long ways in life. Uh, it's certainly not in relationships and everything else, but it was something that I had to run into and go through. Um, but as I got into Cody arts um, with uh, Don and Jay Sensei, uh, Soke of Yanagiru um, from the Yoshida clan, it was a very, very different access, way of accessing your physicality, your physiology, your psychology. It's just really, 180 degrees and so it was a real process to let go of all of the other stuff that i i put so much time and effort into and 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 had had needed in a sense and i i, I needed to i needed to solve that problem or whatever you want to call that i need to have have done that and and recognized what was in it and probably the i, I sometimes take a large large uh, slap upside the head to realize I need to change where I was going. But um, traveled all the way to Australia and the Philippines to fight. And I was literally in the ring in Australia and didn't get a fight. Oh. Get in the ring. It's really, it's an odd story. And it's, and it's, it wouldn't be common for Aussies because, you know, they're, they're a pretty scrappy lot. This just was one of those odd circumstances. And it was just devastating. I mean, I traveled halfway across the world. I trained so hard. Oh, yeah. You know, but it also let me know it was time maybe to reassess, you know, I was with um, the woman who became my wife and just thinking, you know, this is really not going anywhere. I need to, we moved back down to Southern California and, and got some other things going. I, I have to ask you, okay, so uh, I want to go back to this concept of the silent victory. Uh yes. You know, it's it's not all of the show or the, you know, of, of blade hitting blade and all that sound and the dramatic thing that we think of as sword fighting. Yeah. Uh, I, would, I would imagine it's it's it takes a lot more adeptness uh, to get. It almost sounds like magic, you know, when, when well, we're talking. Yeah, that's kind of funny that you'd say that, because one of the guys, one of my students, he'd been a SEAL, got out, was a student of mine for quite a while. Then 9-11 happened. We went back in the, in, in the SEAL team. And so later on, he'd have me down to trade at training attachment and teaching life stuff and stuff for some of these guys. And at one point he goes, yeah, what you're doing is like, like magic shit, like sleight of hand. And I said, yes. So I always ask, especially if I get a group, a room full of men, okay, how many guys are married? Right. How well does fighting work at home to solve problems? doesn't matter if the opponent is literally half your size. doesn't work, right? So why would we fight if we have to solve problems? Because I look at all of this as problem solving, right? So fighting is reciprocity. Fighting, fighting is engagement, hmm. right? And so at the highest level for, for someone, that's not what they were looking for. And by the way, swords won't take all of that banging and smacking together. Right, right. right? I know I've, I've done it, you know, 
and, and things that you don't realize, little things like if you're going to do something like this, you need to have your head turned sideways because there's a little piece of metal and stuff come off like this. Did you ever read Gates of Fire by Stephen Pressfield? I have not. Oh, oh I like Stephen Pressfield, but no. Must read. Absolutely a must read. Okay. okay. Probably the best historical novel ever written. And one that has had a huge impact on some of our special operations community. Hmm. Guys that have been doing all the, the heavy lifting for the last... 20 years okay but he described some types of close battle like that with the little pieces of of, of metal and stuff coming on he does he does a great job of doing that um but i highly recommend that book you, you have to read that book oh it sounds yeah i've i've actually i i i, I know stephen pressfield and i've heard of that book but it's never been actually recommended to me so i'll oh definitely God, i'll definitely happen. What what's happening with your okay okay you guys out there that are listening to this you got to recommend the right books here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let me ask you with this with this concept of the silent yeah. victory, how does I mean, the hisatsu which I'm holding in my hand right now and right. and many of your knives most of your knives um, have a similar profile have this similar sort of okay um, of but, but but hang on let me awesome. let me ask you real quickly how how does the concept of the silent victory play into the design of this knife because i know it's in there okay well it doesn't those are separate questions <laughs> in a sense okay okay um the silent victory is a methodology the tool is the tool depending upon circumstances and what you're going to use <laughs> you're holding a knife that was designed for 0311s 11 bravos um to put in their kit um when they were downrange in 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 urban environments in close combat in, in Iraq, right. And, and other places. So, um, you know, so that is a particular engagement type, right? It's not a primary, the vast majority of the time, right. Mm -hmm. it might not even be a secondary necessarily, but you know, everybody says, well, you know, never bring a knife to a gunfight. It's like, always bring a knife to a gunfight. Yeah. So I bring two knives, two guns. I try to have at least two other people with knives and guns, right? It's kind of a stupid thing. Are you going to try to fight somebody knife to gun if they've got any type of distance or, or something like that? Well, that's a, you know, that's absurdity in that sense of the term. However, there's many, many of people that have over the last 20 years, because we've been heavily engaged for a long period of time that have told me, that that knife or other ones and stuff that I'd taught them had saved their lives in the moment because of circumstances that they were in. You're up close around people all the time. You might be driving a vehicle. One of the guys is telling me, yeah, we were doing a day off, which is really uncommon for this particular group, you know, and we're going through the marketplace and he said, I saw this guy in a dish dash man jammies. And, uh, and he said, you know, to the driver, he said, this guy's going to be trouble. And he said, and so, you know, when, when he got close, the guy came up with a mock rob in the window. He said, I, I caught his arm. I, I, I used his elbow against the, the dash like he taught it. Took the satsu out, pop right behind the clavicle. He said, it dropped like a stone. He said, you know, and it's so, so being able to help people, you know, that's a tool for something like that. It's not a go back and forth tool if you can help it. You know, I don't teach knife fighting. It's a really bad idea had just enough experience with that to realize walking away one time, don't ever do this to yourself again. <laughs> okay. Right? Okay. Let me so, ask you specifics. You don't have to tell me yeah. specifics of your yeah. situation, but why is knife fighting slash knife dueling? Like you might do in a colleague class where you're going hit for hit and just kind of developing your speed and timing it's attributes. It's fine. And I have a Filipino background, but, but I've been in the Philippines. But but, know, ex but explain to people at, why a knife fight is a some of the methodologies, right? Mm -hmm. They're not very sophisticated. You could look at other people like maybe old man Kenyeti Dosiparas, and he was very slick with his stuff. Mm -hmm. Very tight, very slick, very different, right? The going back and forth when you have lethality the, is, is a bad idea because at any moment, and somebody could even nick something when you're dying and you won't even know it in a minute. People don't realize it, but knives don't hurt much. And very, very often people can be badly cut and have no clue. I remember myself one time, I'm, I'm, I'm bleeding all over and I'm like, where's all the blood coming from? Mm -hmm. It's you. And I'm like, 
out and you feel it. You feel bumps and stuff. It's kind of like when you're fighting in the ring or, or whatever. It's not that you don't feel a lot of that. It's just that it doesn't have much. It's, it's, it doesn't hurt. Yeah. I mean, a poke in the eye hurts. The end of the nose stings a bit, you know, stuff like that. But it, it doesn't hurt much. Endorphins and everything, your body's used. So, so what happens is you could be going back and forth with somebody and he might nick something that can't be fixed and you don't even know it yet. Yep. Right. And so you don't want to get, put yourself in a position of doing something like that. It's just a really bad idea. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've heard. If you want to use the knife to solve a problem, mm -hmm. then you need to set the situation up and not get caught in the situation. Does that make sense? Yeah. It makes a hell of a lot of sense. Uh, you know, if you don't approach many things that way, you're going to find yourself in bad situations all the time. Yeah, right. <laughs> so but, uh, from that, so how much time and preparation is going into setting, getting myself in the best possible position I could be to solve the problem instead of finding myself in the worst possible position and then having to fight my way out of it? There's no art in that. Because the art is strategy and strategy is putting yourself in a good position, the best position, right? It's not to put yourself in a bad position, you know, like the martial arts guy in the movies walks down the alley and he's like, he's like sensitive, something's not right, but he keeps walking anyway. And he yeah. walks <laughs> right, and all of a sudden he's him and six guys. Well, that's not strategy. That's stupid. Yeah. You should have six guys and catch the one guy in the alley. That's strategy. So. so so what does this look like when you're teaching this kind of thing in a in a class? Many of us have done martial arts. We're familiar with what a martial arts class might look like, uh, you know, 95 percent of the time. But when you're when you've gone beyond uh, teaching the basics and you've gone beyond, um, you know, training to the point where you're just fluid and, and it just comes naturally. What does a class look like when you're when you're teaching this concept? Because it is a concept. As so you made it out. So this concept, I mean, beginning knife people, it's difficult. So, you know, I'm teaching some basic things if I'm doing that. Um, I look at knives like this and, and most of the time, that's why I don't put a lot of knife stuff up on my YouTube channel and stuff. I mean, I'm not taking a knife out unless that's, it, it, it's a lethal situation. Mm -hmm. I'm not taking it out to scare somebody. I'm not taking to drive somebody off. You know, I might take it out to cut somebody out of the seatbelt in the car. I've done that a couple of times. I might take it out to, you know, cut open some fruit, but I'm not taking it out on against a person unless the need for lethality is there. Okay. Right. So that's a very special group of people, which I can't discuss. It's impossible. I can't, I can't talk about that. Um, mostly with people trying to, you know, for, for personal defense. Um, if it's a situation where, where your life is in danger or the life of your loved ones, then the methodologies start to come into play a bit. A lot of it is understanding, perceiving the time, the timing, right, of movement in the person and not just their physical movement, but their mental psychological movement, um, the path of travel that the force, the force factor is going to take. Okay, so if you take a look at shoulders, okay, well, they're the base of a triangle. If I'm reaching straight to my chin, right, okay, well, I'm coming off an angle to do that. Now, I could change my shoulders and it changes that angle, but it's still perceptible. You know, I can perceive, you could perceive that's taking place. Mm -hmm. So a big part of sword cuts is how can I cut and not be in the place where the person saw me in the moment? I can't step sideways to do that because our binocular vision allows us to see some movements really easy and some movements not well at all. I can displace by my footwork in the moment and I'm not actually where your sword thought I wasn't, but that's something you have to reteach yourself as, as um, my teacher Kroda Tetsuzan sensei, uh, you know, would, would say it's, um, you have to make disappear, right? You have to make it disappear. You have to make the movement disappear. I can see it make disappear. I can see the movement, right? So, so if I move my arm, I can't tell you can see this. If I move my arm like this or I move my arm like that, those are actually two completely different movements. But in the moment, the eye can't see the difference. Mm -hmm. If you raise a shoulder up or hump or all of these things, you're giving tells constantly. Your facial expression, your eyes are tells. 
So there's a couple of concepts in, uh, in, in Koryu. One's called Mushin, no mind. No thinking conscious mind. You can't be thinking in the moment. Okay? So that means none of the looking processing things that we're doing. Mm. And we're not looking in the person's eyes because they're not going to tell us anything, right? On the contrary, you could get yourself in a lot of trouble like that because you're missing too much. So for some right, they would say, look at the distant, direct your eyes at the distant mountain and to focus them. So the tip of the sword, say in Mugen Gumai, uh, which is, you know, like uh, basic middle guard, okay, is, you know, the point of the sword is the mountain, the hands in the tsuka, uh, the tsuka are the are the valley and the chest is the distant mountain. And so you look direct into focus in like Russian Sistema, which is also a sword based art, Mikhail Rabko, um, Vladimir Vasiliev. Um, you, you, you direct your eyes slightly above the head in the process, but you don't look at anything directly. Mm. Um, and that use of eyes is very different for people. So when you focus, focus vision is a very specific, is a very specific methodology. And it's really good for detail, but it's a slow process and it doesn't see much. So I can't be focused vision when, you know, say I'm in an engagement with multiple people. Say I'm doing an entry and even though I see somebody that needs to be serviced, there's all kinds of other possibilities that could be in, in entering this engagement that I can't see if I focus, hmm. right? Because focus by definition means I'm letting a whole lot of other stuff out and I'm bringing it all down to one little thing. So, so you don't need certain types of details, but you need a lot of information it has to process fast, it has to process rapidly. If that makes sense. Yes. Then this concept of vision is something I've thought about before, um, because I've noticed that's how I drive. Uh, I leave my vision wide open because you never know who's coming here and here, uh, you know, from your left or from your right. I try and keep my peripheral vision open as much as possible and then notice that my eyes dart in for focus on things that are either drawing my interest or 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 drawing my attention but yeah i i i feel like i drive better when i do that for that reason you know, driving and i tell my students especially <clears throat> driving is uh, a perfect opportunity to practice all of this because your awareness of things and your ability to pick up anomalies without your conscious mind having to go oh what's that become critical factors Right. And so when you're driving, which is a dangerous thing, probably the most dangerous thing that most people do every day, mm -hmm. you can practice this or you could be, you know, you, you could be one of these people. Right. One of these people within their lap or something as they're driving. Yeah. Right. Or their brain is playing a movie in their head, which has nothing to do with reality. Instead of check the mirrors, check this, check that. What's that? Boom, 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 boom. And if you're driving certain routes, you know, how often have I driven that route? Are there anomalies on this route that I should pay attention to? You know, now, if you happen to be in, in, in a foreign country, in a non provisional environment, you've got all kinds of possibilities. What might be on that route that could be dangerous to you, right? It could be an IED, it could be an ambush setup, could be this, could be that, could be all kinds of things, right? And so you can just practice. And I tell my students, if, if the only time you do this is in the dojo, well, you're not going to ever get this. This has to become how you look, how you think. You walk through your house, when you get up to a corner, before you break the plane, if you just take and drop your head down 45 degrees, your peripheral vision increased down along. Now you can't see, you could see feet though. I can know if there's somebody down that wall before I break the plane. And so mm. you just some things like that. It's the same going up. If you go in something that's up here, right? If I look up 45 degrees, I'm gonna see back up this way, okay? And you teach yourself, just to do that. And then it becomes no effort. Like you sit some of some virtuoso or something on the piano and see how they make it look so easy. Yeah, it's like a hundred thousand hours of a practice. Yeah, yeah right. It's simple. But as you as you program yourself, it just becomes who you are and what you do. And that becomes, you know, that just adds to your, you know, and, and your intuition and all of those things. Um, another concept is called Mizu no Kokoro. So Mizu's water and Kokoro is like your essence, your spirit. It's kind of like maybe include your soul. It's a hard concept in Japanese, but it's like the essence of the person. And so if you're completely calm inside, 
You're like still water, like a mirror. Well, now you're reflecting objective reality. Blow on that water. Let emotions and stuff come in. Now it's subjective reality and you're trying to, see, trying to see little pieces and put them together. So the goal is in that moment of life and death to be not thinking and completely reflective. I mean, in the universe, every problem has within the problem, the solution. The solutions aren't somewhere else. So if you can, and I use the word listen metaphorically, if you can listen well enough, the opponent's going to tell you exactly what you need to know, exactly when you need to know it. If you're in your own way, you can't hear. If you're driven, you know, aggressive and fear, I can take that. Well, you can't hear very well, even if you're well trained, which means later on, like last week I had dental surgery because you get hit more than you thought. And later on in life, it gets expensive. It's not you. <laughs> right? But it didn't matter in the moment. Only this other thing matters where, yeah. you know, even if you, even if you were, you know, even if the other guy went to the hospital and, and you couldn't get out of, out of sit, sit up straight out of bed and eat for three days afterwards, right? If that had been lethality, we'd both be in the ground, I guess. Right, right. Whoever, whoever dies last wins. Is that how it works? Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's what I was told in, in Kali, you know, yeah, right. whoever <laughs> dies second wins the knife fight. Yay. Um, right. we, can put, we can put that on your gravestone. Yeah, exactly. I won. Uh, yes. That, I, I want to talk a, a second about this sleight of hand concept. I mean, you were talking about jabbing straight to the eyes and how that's an easy, um, well, kind of an so easy. Much. How do I make my body not move in its normal way? How do I make it so it lines up? Like right now, I'm flexing my, you can't see it, but I'm flexing my rhomboids, which actually bring my scapula in, right? So I'm, I'm literally, right now, I'm flexing my, I'm bringing my right scapula in by flexing the rhomboids minor and major into my spine. And starting from there, how can I make, normally when we reach, we have a, a, a you know, a, a way of coming off the shoulder, which is what, how everybody reaches, but you can literally make it go perfectly straight in the process. Oh, I see. Okay. <clears throat> and that's just one very simple, and you start teaching, did you ever read the book Dune by Frank Herbert? No, no, my wife has, and we've been talking Dune, about it a lot recently. Dune don't do any justice. But this would be like Benny Gesserit training, where you go oh. in and you start realizing, okay, so I can bring my scapula up, make it move up. If I just isolate the levator scapula, which connects at the top inside corner of the scapula, subtrapezius, and at the bottom at the, at, the, at the bottom of the occipital, I can actually make that bone in your back move up, but you can't see it from the front because the only way that it moves in front is by flexor trapezius. And so you start practicing doing little things and realize that we do so much that we have no understanding or control over, but all these are tells to people that can see, mm -hmm. you know, I used to get my students when we do some boxing because not because boxing was the good solution to problem, but all of those other arts I talk, they're good from the standpoint where you get used to people punching at you, you get used to see movement, you get used to staying calm in the process. Right. And, and even a lot of the, the people had some boxing, but they're pushing off their back foot to jab. Well, as soon as you're flexing your back foot, I'm already slipping and moving, right? I don't have to wait for the punch to come out, you know, just a kind of a, a broad. You could, I mean, some of these people are really fast if you wait that long and not get out of the way, right? So, so how do you take that away? Like in, in Cody, you, you can't push off the ground to move and I can't push on the ground to stop. Say that again, please. So I can't push on the ground with my foot to move forward and I can't push on the ground with my front foot to stop. Huh? So it's called ukimi, floating body. So when you move, the body should float. If you touch my shoulders, you should feel no movement going up and down when my feet are hitting the ground. Another way of saying would be musoku no ho, it means no legs. It's kind of like when you see an Aikido uh guy uh they kind of yeah, seem to glide a little bit yes they're they're really studying a very different art I, i'm sure but but they do have that sort of gliding uh not, effect. The same way. not okay. anybody i've seen anyway and i've okay. seen a lot of them i'm not saying nobody does but i haven't seen anybody with that okay so this I, is different yeah, from that Cody movement okay um, so not knocking anybody's thing it's just that i haven't seen that okay you if you're not practicing kenjutsu high level Kenjutsu, 
and there's all kinds of levels, even in old Japan, then, and using Boken work and stuff, they're not practicing Kenjutsu. If you're not practicing Kenjutsu, the chances you have this movement are almost none. Okay. It, you know, as, as uh, Kodosensei used to say, people are misunderstanding Kata. Kata is not about real fighting. Real fighting changes endlessly. Kata takes you into another world. What you're doing with kata is you're programming your body to move in a different way. You're programming your, your mind to access your body in a different way. You're programming like if I do this with my arm, right? Let's see if I can show this just a little. This movement and that movement are not the same movements, but you can't tell by looking. You can tell by feeling. If you grabbed a hold of my wrist, you could tell by feeling, but you can't tell by looking. Okay, so what, what did Sun Tzu say about 500 BC, war is a matter of deception? What could be more truly deceptive than doing exactly what someone has, all, their, whole, their whole body and mind is programmed to view that as something, but it's not that, right? So, so that's, that's the sleight of hand part. Because fakes and fins by definition are false, right? They're fakes and they're huh. fins. They're not real. And this is real, but you can't see it even when you're looking at it. Man, well, that, that's... I'll have to have you because this is the hard thing. I've had people ask, and, and I need to get back to this guy in Brazil. The problem with Zoom classes is if you don't feel this, you can't understand it. You yeah. literally can't understand it, right? Yeah. And even that process, it took time. People said, how long did it take you to get like soft, so to speak? And I would say that beginning steps. It took the 80s, right? It took the 80s and a couple of scary situations I had to put myself in to realize what Anjay Sensei was actually saying, right? Because what I'm hearing and what's being said, I can only hear with the paradigm I have, right? I don't have another paradigm. And so until I can actually tactically, tactically feel another paradigm, I can only go to the one I have. I might recognize it as different, but I can only go to the one I have. That actually brings me back to what I was saying in the very beginning when I asked you about how some people claim ancient martial arts have no place in the modern day. And of course, I can I can see how some things might need to be adapted or changed, but really it's the importance of how familiar, familiar you are with that paradigm that you're yeah. discussing or whatever that paradigm is. Yes. So... Yeah, that's that's a that's a kind of a lazy thing. Listen, if you want to know about surviving life death situations, the old stuff's orders of magnitude better. Because that's what they did. If they acted like the martial arts that we do now, there'd be dead people all over the place. They'd be killing each other right and left. Wouldn't be that people are winning, they'd be killing each other. Because everything's engagement reciprocity. So so right. You, you can't go back to the ancients who know way more about blade shape that by far than we'll ever know. Little kids by three and four had to carry sharp knives and stuff, even even if they were flint, because you couldn't get through that. You couldn't get through your day without being able to cut stuff. Yeah. Right. And at every point, you're killing animals. Not an easy thing to do with some of those things. Right. You're fighting off predators, you, human or otherwise. Right. With tools, you know, all kinds of tools. I've got a I've got a bronze. I think it was probably an, uh, a small dagger, but it could be a small spear point from 1000 BC, still sharp by the way. Um, and, and you're looking at, I mean, it's, it's really a, a work of art, right? 3000 years ago. So when people say they didn't know in the old days, yeah, that's just arrogance, which is a dangerous thing. Humility is really beneficial to you, but arrogance is a, is a, is a bad, bad thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's agreed. I agree with you on that. I think maybe I'm misrepresenting the argument I've heard. I've heard like karate. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? That's how unarmed people defended against the samurai sword. You know, Kali, why would you do that? That's two ancient people on a battlefield with, sh with short swords. That's not how we well, fight anymore. Kali, I think that's, I mean, is it short swords? Yes. And so people that are doing some of these things like this with small knives and it's like, those things are designed for barongs and short swords, wagisashi, stuff that lops off arms. Yeah. This is a way, you mean that, anyway, that whole, we're not getting, but 
I wouldn't suggest that just for saying, but I mean, those people are, you know, they look, they went out in the jungle with those things. Those were working tools and they fought with those tools. Right. right? And it's true that karate is that, but what if you don't have anything else? Right. So what, what if those are the tools that you have? Mm -hmm. So are they as efficient in a lot of ways? No, but in fact, you know, a comma or a sickle in, uh, in Okinawa is for cutting rice and stuff. Okay. So this is a Japanese one. I don't have the Kusari part that the chain and the ball, I can't remember what happened, some of the moves, but you can see that this is not designed for a farmer's tool. This is designed mm. for human beings, right? It's designed to hit and, and pull on the way out. So, so, you know, but the thing is people have to fight with what they have. Mm -hmm. Right. And some of them got really good at depending. And obviously some of those things are not going to be good for war, but what if you're walking down the street and you got a book or you can grab up a rock or break off a stick, right? And you don't have another tool on you. Well, some of those things then can be, can be beneficial to you, right? Yeah. Um, the operating system though is very different, but however, I mean, the stuff that I've been fortunate to study is up at the, you know, there's levels in any society of, of skill, right? There's levels in any skill. So I'm fortunate to have been exposed to being trained for a long period of time on, on two different, um, really masters, although they wouldn't use that term, mm -hmm. uh, in two different systems uh, of, of Kodiu. And that it's just a different ball game, but that wasn't the majority of people by any stretch of the imagination. Right. It's like anything else there's, you know, and that's why you get people like Nimoto Musashi or Yaki's people that could easily beat other people or multiples of other people. They're on a different level. Yeah. Right. They're on a different level. Did you design this knife? And the, and, and I also want to talk about, I want to talk about the knives that you have. Uh, you've done a lot of, um, collaborations with CRKT on the production end, but you have also begun uh, uh, Williams uh, Williams Blade Design a couple of years ago, and you have... Yeah, it's actually been more than a couple now. I mean... Really? You've got yeah. these beautiful, <laughs> beautiful versions of this kind of knife, of this style of knife. Some, some God, they're gorgeous. Yeah. So, um, so, Williams Blade Design got started by a request for some special guys that I train um, for collaboration with Daniel Winkler. Um, mm. And so, you know, designed the knife for them. Daniel knife Winkler. maker to the seals, by the way. Yeah. So, so, so that, that got it started. And of course they have specific needs, you know, they have specific needs when we're designing knives. It was this, this particular knife right here. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's see, I don't know how we can see all that. Okay. Um, and, and so that, that got that going. And then, you know, some, some other requests, we were going someplace and we want something a little larger, um, depending upon circumstances that, that really got us off the ground. Um, and that's with my son, Christopher, who has been around this his whole life one way or another. He remembers me putting knife things together, you know, as a hobby when he was just a little kid. And then, you know, he did the Bouguet trading catalog when he was in high school. And so he's been around this and he's actually doing a really good job with, with a lot of the, the folding designs, blade shape, like this is Osiraku Zukuri. Sweet. Like this stuff, so that's called Osiraku Zukuri. So we use a few shapes. Hiru Zukuri, Osiraku Zukuri, some Shobu Zukuri designs, right? Um, but he's really, he's really done an excellent job. I'm actually very, I'm very happy, but very proud at the same time because his innovations and stuff, a lot of the stuff he's designing is really excellent. Um, uh, we have some uh, fans of the show, some some uh, friends of the show who are carrying these, and uh, as, especially the smaller version of the knife you just held up, the fix, of the fixed blade. Yes. And People are going bonkers over them. I too love them. I have a question though, uh, right. uh, for um, 
Uh, I want I want you to talk a little bit about the handle design in particular with the one that Jim has up on screen to the left. Uh, now there's so no left guard. My left. There's you're no guard about, on this knife. There's no guard on this knife. About, you're talking about but, this handle design. I'm talking about. You see the one on screen? It's got a very simple. You know, it's the handle design that you usually use without a guard. And yeah. it's so explain to us. Okay. How, you, how you can have an awesome thrusting knife like this and not need a guard. So there's a lot of knife cultures, by the way, that don't use guards on small knives. Okay. Just aware of that. So the reason is, how do I hold the knife? That's a big part of it. How am I going to hold the knife? So if I'm thrusting and I'm holding it like this, that's it. That's a inefficient in a lot of ways, easiest to block. If I'm thrusting and I hold it like this and I'm coming in like this, this is far more difficult for somebody to block. And the whole knife is lined up with my hand, mm. right? It's lined up with my hand. If I happen to decide I need to stab or something, then this go, finger goes over or that thumb goes over in the process, right? And I practice, I want to be able to move the knife back and forth, edge forward maybe edge you know uh, edge towards me edge forward i want to change it back another way and there's different ways that i know you guys can't really see that let me see if i can move that back a little bit more you know and so you learn well how am i manipulating the knife what do i want to do how do i turn it from one orientation to another i can't be caught up in stuff and guards get caught up in gear and everything right so what you do is you spend time learning how to handle your knife with both hands it's no different from my shooting i shoot with both hands and both eyes Pistol rifle doesn't matter, right? I shoot with both hands, both eyes. I use my swords with both hands for all kinds of reasons. And one you just never know, but you start practicing so you can manage the tool depending upon what I'm actually trying to accomplish in the minute, in the moment, because I'm going to be very specific. If I have to solve a problem, the more specific I am in what in, in getting to the right solution, the more efficient and effective the solution is going to be. If you start flailing and all of this kind of stuff, well, your efficiency is going to go way down and that's not good. So, how do you handle, how do you handle the, the, the opposite energy? You have someone who is um, the opposite of your uh, inner quiet calm and they're coming after yeah. you like a caveman. I love it. Great. Those are not my day. Those are not the dangerous people. So part of this um, is I'm not going to contest for space with vector force in our strategy. We have something the first, the strategic prime directive, do not contest for space with vectors of force. So that means no blocking. That means not being there. It's the only thing that works to the entire force continuum, right? The fact that I can take punches or take some stuff or blocking, what can you block? Right? I mean, there's all kinds of stuff you can't block. So right from the beginning, you don't contest for space. So if somebody's coming in, they're big in this, well, that's great. That gives me a lot of energy. It makes it really easy for me to see what they're doing. And, you know, I can't demonstrate it here, but if we get a chance to get together, um, I, you know, I can easily maneuver, shall we say. But the footwork is really different. It's not like the footwork I used in boxing or wrestling, where footwork is really, really important. Boxers with really good footwork are the most successful boxers, mm -hmm. right? Because if you don't have good footwork, I would say victory is in defeat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Your feet, my feet. Um, so, so, but our way of moving is different because it's not a shifting like this. You need to be able to displace movement that the eye can't pick up in the moment, right? So the eye is phenomenally, you know, designed implement. But like everything, it has limitations. And a lot of the limitations exist between one ear and the other ear. They're not just in the eye. So, so how can you how can you train yourself to deceive the eye in the movement? You know, Flavius Vegetus Reynatus and his De Re Militari, you know, what fourth century on ago, we know. In every battle after all, the eye is fooled first. Okay. All right. Well, how do we fool the eye? Let's start working on, I need to fool the eye. I need the eye to see something that it already is programmed for that isn't what's actually happening. Hmm. And so you've got, you've got people that spent long periods of time studying how to do this. 
and fortunately passed it forward, right? Added on here and there, maybe a little got lost, but somebody else added on. And so the value of the old, old stuff is, is incredible because as, as sophisticated as we think some of the modern stuff is, the old stuff is way more sophisticated, way more sophisticated. To some of it's just like, you know, if you get certain people, Kuroda Sensei, by the way, is not doing well physically. Anybody that has extra prayers for him, he's in the hospital. But his movement is probably the best of the old movement. If you go on and look him up, you can see Kuroda Tetsuzan. You'll see some videos and stuff. Um, and every now and then you'll see him move things like 180 degree movement that you can't even see in the middle of from the side hmm. where everything looks the slowest. In front of him, it's just, he just goes from one position to an end and his blade's there and you're like, how'd you do that? Right? So, so, um, and I've had, I've had the opportunity to work with some special people. Um, one in particular who I trained when he was still a teenager. Now he's been in the military over 20 years. Um, at the very, very top of a very, very exclusive food chain who has implemented a, a whole lot of that, this stuff over a long period of time. And, you know, just because the tools are different, the tools are the tools. Musashi said in his book, a warrior shouldn't have a favorite tool. Hmm. You should be able to use any tool. Okay, well, the tools are just different. You know, people say, I want to carry a knife for self-defense. What do you carry? I said, I carry a pistol for self-defense. Not really for so much for self-defense, but for like Eli Dickens, mm -hmm. right? You know, people say, well, why do you carry everywhere? Well, you know, what, you, what are you afraid of? My fear is something like that would happen and I wouldn't be able to help. Same reason you look in my car in the front door, there's an iPad, individual first aid kit, both doors, another one back here, on the back, right? Stuff to quick grab, you know, yeah. not major bleeding, plug chest holes, do some various things, right? Just because, you know, I have some knowledge and training and, and the warrior's, the warrior's a, a, a protector and defender, right? It's, he's not a fighter in that sense of the term for mm. his ego or any of that stuff. Right. You know, there's a, there's a concept in, uh, I don't have the scroll. I've got the scrolls, but they're not up. Um, there, there's two characters, a uh, Satsujin Ken, the killing sword and Katsujin Ken, the life giving sword. So in some of the modern derivations, they love the Katsujin Ken, the life giving sword. And so, um, years ago, um, I was trying to find a Shoto master to write out both characters. And we read that Setsuni to Katsujin Ken. It's the sword that cuts down evil is the sword that gives life. <laughs> okay. So if the sword can't cut down evil, it's not a life-giving sword. It's just a useless piece of steel. Right. Right. And, and, the, and the goal is you're a protector and defender. So finally, uh, after like four Shoto masters, I wrote a long letter to... Uh, um, Kondo Sensei in, uh, in Kyoto, you know, Sensei, and, and explaining this because there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, Kami in writing that, that killing sword. And I said, and I, and I just explained all of that to him, what I just explained. And so he wrote the, that, that scroll and then wouldn't charge me for it. <laughs> he charged me for the paper and the ink and that was it. And so that, that gives what's called uh, giri, a duty, a reciprocal duty. And so one of my top student instructors, uh, Jim O'Connell, came up with the idea. So we got a, a Navajo shaman to carve a peace pipe and mm. flew, flew to Kyoto and, and presented, even presented to Kondo Sensei. Um, but that's literally what the people I work with at one level here, that's what they do. They cut down evil to protect the innocent. And boy, there's some serious evil out there. Yeah, no right? doubt about that. So, well, how do you want this? Okay, um, you've had this storied career. You've had a <laughs> life, a lifetime, a, a lifetime of of martial arts training from Sistema, which to me is so weird. I'd love to have you explain it to me, but oh, not right now. Very good. Misha is, is very good. I was really surprised 
we were at Toby Threadgill's in Texas right after 9-11. No, right before 9-11. And we're watching this Russian guy do this stuff. And guys are kind of making comments. And I'm watching this thing. And I go, no, you guys. This guy's good. He's really good. And I'm thinking, where the Russians get this stuff, right? And it's like, and so I made a thing. I said, well, uh, if I can get a hold, I'm going I'm to train with this guy. Right. And so uh, he was supposed to come over, but then he couldn't 9 11 and everything. And then so it was later on, but it was, that was that year, that was 2000, late 2001. Um, he came to Toronto and I got a chance to, to work with him. And I was, I'm, I was very impressed. I was very impressed because he's very much like classical Cody in so many ways and very deep. And it looks funny, but go ahead and get out there. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, I mean, I, I, I can't even uh, imagine. I can't even like looking at it, and who knows? Maybe I'm not looking at the legit stuff, but looking at it, 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 I can't even. It must be so good at what it does that I look at it. I'm like, that's not real. So you know, a friend of mine, um, we were in Russia, and he was uh, not at the time, but he'd been former, uh, uh, former uh, kickboxing European kickboxing champion, mm -hmm. right? Gentleman from England. And, uh, and, uh, Misha's like, yeah, go ahead, do whatever you're going to do. And, uh, and, and, and Misha heard him, which he didn't intend to do. Right. But he hits so much harder than it looks like. And his timing is so impeccable. It's, 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 it's hard. You have to, it, it's another experience thing. You got to experience it. Yeah. So, and I, I felt so bad because I, I should have told my friend, I should have said, you know, make sure you go a little slow at the beginning because whatever energy you bring is the energy that's coming back. Right, it's like right. if you throw a ball against the wall a little harder, expect it to come back a little harder, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I know it looks funny, and Misha should probably lose a little weight, but the deal is he is really good. Okay, I, okay. So that is the guy. That is the guy I've seen. What do you want your legacy to be, James? That's what I was going at with all this. You've got you've a good got dad and a good grandpa. That's that's, my <laughs> hey, man, that's, that's, what, I, that that's what I want. That's what I want. There you go. So uh, say it again. So, you know, where I'm at at this point, you know, I'm in my mid-70s. Um, I'm very functional for my age. Um, I'm still actively teaching, including people that go in non-permissive environments. Um, the thing that I get the most um, gratification for is when I've had a positive impact on somebody's life. It could be, you know, talking to one of my students today who's not as old as I am, but he's getting close, um, you know, saying, well, you, you taught me how to be a man, you know, and I'm like, oh, okay. Or, you know, just various things like that. You know, that where, where you've had a, enough of a, a positive impact on somebody's life that's benefited them. You know, some guys come back and they say, hey, you know, you saved my life with what you taught me. <sighs> what do you do with that? You know, I buried a lot of guys in 1968. I pulled a, I had a lot of folded flags to a whole lot of parents and, and, and wives and next of kin. So, and I'm still in a, in a, in a place where we lose people. And, and, yeah, so if you can if you can bring them back to their family, like the gentleman that in in the one situation daylight up early when we were talking, he says, "Yeah, well, you know, this we're just it's not really the proper way of thing." I said, "Listen, you came back okay. You couldn't you couldn't you couldn't give me any more than that." So for me, that's the most important thing it impact you have on lives. So whether people like this or that, or whether they look at the stuff or all this later on, isn't is isn't you know I mean. We make quality stuff. I design and, and, and the people we work with make whatever price range you're working with. They make quality stuff, right, for the price. Yeah. And it works. It's designed, all designed to work. It's not designed. I don't, I don't think of what in my head I look at what's going to work, how and why. I look at history, right, because our ancestors um, and, and however, for myself personally, how many people can I, how, how many people have I helped and, and been positive for? 
Um, well, well, I'd venture a guess to say that it's not just the people you've trained. Uh, and now now I get knife corny, but it's also the people who love your work, love your your knives and and get enjoyment or actual use out of them. I thank God haven't had to get actual use out of this. This has just been a, a thing that I appreciate for its pure beauty. And it is a beautiful knife. It also makes my uh, basement bar feel a little bit more secure <laughs> <laughs> as it guards the whiskey. Well, you um, know, my grandfather told me when I was like six years old, he said, son, a man needs a knife. And so, you know, I, I remember my most precious possession was a jackknife, right? Mm -hmm. None of them locked in those days. I mean, there were knives that locked, but nothing that we had. We had what we called jackknives, right? right? And um, I remember um, we used to hold them like like this, right? I mean, first time I stabbed somebody in self-defense, I was in grade school. <laughs> wow. All right. Well, we're going to talk about that in the exclusive uh, interview we're, we're going to do after this. James, I want to thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It was more than a pleasure meeting you. And uh, I know there's so much more uh, we could talk about. So it was a real pleasure. Thanks for coming on, sir. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. Um, take care. Yeah. Do you use terms like handle the blade ratio, walk and talk, hair pop and sharp, or tank like? Then you are a dork and a knife junkie. Two things that I really pulled out of that. I mean, there's going to be a lot that I pull out of that, but two things. It's the idea of not fighting, but problem solving. Love that. And the whole sleight of hand thing. I like, I know what a feign is, uh, you know, when you're fighting, but to think of it as sleight of hand and develop it from there and train in that way it's mind-blowing to me i think it's awesome anyway it was a great pleasure having james williams on i've been a huge admirer of his knives for a long time and after this conversation i think i have to get one of those winkler collaboration knives they are so sweet uh be sure to join us here next sunday for another interview with another uh amazingly interesting knife person and uh check wednesday for the midweek supplemental Thursday night, you know it's Thursday Night Knives, live 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. And if you want to listen on the go, be sure to download the show to your favorite, favorite podcast apps. So for Jim working his ma magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.